Hello, my friends. Hello. Okay, let's face it. We're not friends yet, but we are family. That's amazing. So who am I? I'm Bruxy. I'm a pastor of a church called The Meeting House. I'm in Canada. My th- Canadians or you just love Canadians? What? Uh, we're just so soft and squishy. All right, good. And this is my first time in Tennessee, and I have to say, you guys got a good thing going on here. There is a real sweet spirit. The music so far, has it not just been really a, have a sweetness to it? I've been thinking it's not just sweetness to our ears, it's sweetness to our hearts. What a blessing. And I was, I was just thinking about this as I was soaking it in. I, I was thinking that there, it's, not just, uh, it's not just the sound of the music has the sweetness, it's the spirit behind it and that flows through it. That spirit that then, and I was, as I was hearing it, it was hitting my heart. And then, as I'm listening, I'm thinking, my heart recognizes that spirit because I have the same spirit in me. And the spirit that is in the songwriters and in the musicians and then that flows through that to us, that same spirit is in us. And, and, and it meets and it creates this beautiful synergy and this, this joy and this delight of recognition. You know, that's always true, by the way, whenever you want to hear more of the voice of God, the heart of God, and you're, you're saying, God, I'm seeking you, I need to learn more. As, as Westerners, we're such individualists, uh, sometimes we take our Bibles away with us, we say, I'm just going to study, I'm going to flip through, and I'm going to try and hear from God, I'm going to pray, God, please speak to me. But remember, the same spirit that's in you, and the same spirit that has inspired scripture, is also the same spirit that's in your brothers and your sisters. And when you come together in this kind of sweet unity, it not only honors God, but it also amplifies the voice of God in your life. Because now that same spirit is being multiplied over and over again and speaking to you through your brothers and sisters. And, and man, we need each other. And it does honor God at the same time because, you know, a parent doesn't just love having an individual relationship with their kids. One thing a parent loves is hearing their kids playing together nicely. Isn't it true? If you have more than one kid, it's not just I love each of you as individuals, but when we're together as a family and, and you hear your kids getting along, and actually applying some of the principles of love that you've been trying to train them in, and then they're treating each other that way. That just does a father of mother's heart so good. And so I sense that we're hearing the voice of God more that we're together, but then also we're just seeing God smile. We're just sensing his pleasure and his joy. And so I was thinking, when I was listening to this music, I was like, here's the issue. I feel guilty that I'm the guy who's got to go up and be the excuse for the music to stop. I, and I, was, I, I don't want to do that. I just wanted to keep going. I'm like you. And then I just prayed, God, may the same spirit just keep flowing. May the same spirit just keep flowing as we kind of amplify the voice of God for each other. So that's my prayer for the next while till we get back to the music that this doesn't feel like a complete interruption, but the same spirit's going to be talking to us and dancing with us and smiling upon us. Mm. Hey, let me pray. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being your kids. We thank you that we have the privilege of being together. We thank you that that your spirit speaks to us and through us. I pray that even when tonight is over and we're chatting with other people, that we'll be attuned to how your spirit's still speaking to us and how your spirit wants to speak through us to others around us. And we will just be filled with a sense of joyful privilege that we get to be a part of this family. I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, can I tell you my favorite word? Of course you're going to say yes, because I have the microphone. I'm going to do what I want anyway. Here's my favorite word. Homothumadon. What's that? Say it with me. Homothumadon. Homothumadon. All right, very good. Say it again. Homo thumadon. It's not a dinosaur from the late Jurassic period. It is actually a Greek word that is my favorite word in the New Testament Greek. Homo thumadon is a word that often just gets translated really simply together. In the book of Acts, the New Testament church is said to be together. Old translations would say with one accord or in union together or with one heart or with one mind all different translations of this same greek word homo thumadon say it again homo thumadon now here's the amazing thing about this word as you begin to break it down it becomes richer and richer so homo thumadon means to be together but not just together that's a a very 
um, a, a very weak translation. It's two different words, a compound word, two different words brought together. Homo means one. Thumadon comes from the word thumos, which in the New Testament Greek means rage. It's not just regular anger. That has a different word. Orge is the word for anger or wrath. But there is this Greek word for anger or wrath that's absolutely crazy with rage. We used to almost uncontrollable. In fact, it's attributed to Satan at times where he rages against the church or rages against Christ. And this word for absolute crazy rage, and at its root, it actually just means to snort wildly. Right? So this word thumos is just like a... Okay. All right, so, so it takes this word thumos, this raging, snorty, snort, snorterson, and it partners it with the word for one, homo and thumos. And it brings it together, and we translate it together. But it's more than that, baby. This word homothumadon, this is the characteristic of the church in the book of Acts, remember, that they're filled with homothumadon is this raging passion for oneness. This absolutely snorting energy for one another's togetherness. That we will say, we will not let anything take this down. We will not let anything get in the way. I am going to fight to get closer. See, that's the thing with the kingdom's fight to expand. You ever play the board game Risk? Yeah, it's a quick way to start family arguments. So you know, that's the point of a kingdom. You know, kingdoms want new land, and then they want to protect their land, and they want to, the, the thing, the New Testament kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And yes, we want to expand. We want to conquer new lands. And here's the land we want to conquer. The land we want to conquer is the distance between you and me that's keeping us separated. I will fight to conquer that land so that you and I can rage with a passion for our closeness, for our oneness and for our togetherness. And events like this are so beautiful for being kingdom, you know, for conquering some of that distance. Because we're not just, you know, disembodied brains that you can, you can listen to a thousand sermons on the doctrine of church unity, but we're not just disembodied brains. We're not just thinking machines. We're, we're embodied beings. You know, God had made us physical for a reason. He loves the physical too. If he just wanted us to be spirit beings, he could have stopped with the angels. He already had those. But he decided to create a physical world and his most precious beings to put in physical bodies and to breathe his own spirit into us. And he delights in the physical. That's why his ultimate plan is not to rescue us out of here so we can just live as disembodied spirits in heaven forever, but to create a new heaven and a new earth, right, where the spiritual and the physical comes together. At the end of the book of Revelation, the new Jerusalem comes down. And we have this physical, spiritual blend of something beautiful of which Jesus' own resurrection body is the prototype, the first fruits is what the Bible would say, of what we are all going to experience one day, and all of creation will be renewed. Until then, we are groaning, we are hurting. That's part of our honest confession. It's so true. And we have doubts and we have questions. The Apostle Paul, who is filled with the Spirit, inspired by the Spirit, writing Scripture, says, you know, now we see through a glass darkly. One day we're going to know fully, even as we are fully known. But right now we don't see that much. So when you have questions and we're feeling like, I just can't see that clearly, that's true. We admit that. We do not have to be the people who pretend that we are upright, outright, upright, downright, happy all the time. I don't know. Did anyone ever sing that song when you were a kid? Or is that just a, just a Canadian curse? No, you sang that as well? I'm in right, out, right, up, right, up, right, down, happy all the time. I'm, okay, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it's a beautiful song except for one thing. It's from the devil. Here's why. It's beautiful, though. It's, it's lovely, and it's nothing creepier than kids singing it because, you know, kids can be creepy. So, so here's the thing. Father of three daughters. I love my girls. I love it. It's a good thing I had girls, by the way. I was always playing, Father, don't give me a son, because I wouldn't know what to do, because I was raised with all sisters. And so I wouldn't know what to do if I had a son, so God was gracious. It was wonderful. I had three older sisters, too. They were all older. That was so good. Hand-me-downs were a bit of a drag, i got to admit. There you go. That's it. There you go. Okay, good. Finally made it to the back. All right, good. I right, so yeah, really, you, you give me a son, say, let's toss this pig skin, Dad. I wouldn't know what to do with that. I don't even know how to say it, but, you know, give me an easy bake oven. I'm good to go for the afternoon. So, 
All right, so I got my three kids. But really, I'm thinking about this song. We learned in Sunday school. I'm in, right out, right up, right down, right happy all the time. And I'm thinking, no, no, no. When Jesus promised the abundant life, you know John 10, 10, I'm here to give you life and here to give it to you more abundantly. The abundant life, listen, if this is life with its ups and its downs, I don't know if you can see me way the back, but I'm waving my arms, right? Like it's out the window going down the highway. If this is life as, with ups and its downs, the abundant life is not up here pretending all the time. There's a word for that. It's called heaven. It's a new heaven, a new earth, and every tear will be dried away. But we don't have to pretend right now. That's not, if this is life, then catch me, this is abundant life. You see it? We are going to feel the highs and the lows more deeply. We are going to weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn, and rejoice with those who rejoice. But... We will be the people who don't run away from sorrow, but lean into the pain of life to say, I will carry your burden with you. I'll get under the rock with you. I will cry with you, but we'll do it. Wait, we'll do it. We'll do it together. Homo thumadon. That's, that's almost my second hallelujah. I've got hallelujah, then homo thumadon. Now, I was raised Pentecostal. Hallelujah. Thank you, my brother. So I will feel at home with any callbacks you want to give. I was raised Pentecostal, and it was a very expressive church. We wore tennis shoes to Sunday service just to get a good grip on the wall. It was a, it was a great service. So I'm ready for it. If you want to bring it, I'm ready. I'm now, now I'm now pastor of a church called The Meeting House, and we're like an Anabaptist church that's like Mennonites minus the horse and buggy. We're like urban dwelling Amish, and we're just a little more calm. We're a little more calm, so, so I miss it. So you just you want to bring the goods, that's fine. Shout hallelujah, glory, amen, right on. So this, met, see, see, this is a beautiful thing. Homothumadon can only be achieved by Jesus. There's no, other, there's no other movement on the planet in all history that brings such diverse people together and doesn't just say you're going you're gonna to learn to live together, but says you're not only friends, but says you're family. When the New Testament church called each other brother and sister, that wasn't just poetry. It wasn't just, hey, bro, hey, sis. It wasn't just poetry. It wasn't just culture. This was a familial culture where family was important. And you had people who were Jews and Gentiles, old and young, people who had been enemies, the oppressor and the oppressed, saying we are now entering a new kingdom. And we are a new family within this new kingdom with new citizenry. And all of that's bound together. So I say, hello, brother. Hello, sister. And I mean it. I've got your back like family. There's nothing like this. And nothing else can do that. You can, political realms, you can get along with other parties, with other people who vote for the same party. And you can get along with people who are similar to you in the same sect, if you're in the same sect of a different religion. And, and to be honest, when, when just within Christianity, we only get along with Christians who are just like us and agree with us, that does not display anything miraculous at all. Right? That is a worldly unity that anybody could have. When Pentecostals get along with Pentecostals, Baptists, et cetera, et cetera, we say, well, that's nice, but there is nothing that Jesus prayed for in John 17 when he prayed that we might be one, even as he and the Father is one. But when you get people who disagree and are diverse and our backgrounds are different, and we're not even sure we align on everything theologically, but we say, wait a second, that spirit, that spirit that I recognize as the spirit of Christ is in you and is in me, I will fight for that. I will fight for it. And here's the, here's the thing. We live in a world where social media makes it easier to hear more voices, but it's also easier to take the cheap shot of disagreement. Yeah. Of disagreement because I'm not personally involved in your life. So I can, you know, you've heard of mansplaining. Uh, just where, we, you know, we men feel we've just got to correct our sisters and just explain everything for them. There's evangelical splaining. Where we just feel like everything somebody says, I just got to correct you a little bit. I just got to tweak that a little bit. And I just got to show you where it's not quite enough. And evangelical splaining is really popular. And, and we don't celebrate what someone does stand for and is accomplishing. But we want to tear down why it's not quite up to my standard. Social media can be a call-out culture. You know, a call-out culture where you say, that's not good. I'm not putting up with this. I'm going to call you out on that. And there's a place for that prophetic voice. But there's an even better version of that. And that's the call-in culture. Not the call-out culture, but the call-in culture. Say, well, that's, I disagree, but you're my brother, and I'm going to fight to try and understand you and have you understand me, and in the end, we're going to come away as family. So let's go at it. But let's go at it as family. 
You know, psychologists say that one of the marks of a functional loving family is that we can laugh together and enjoy humor together. But another mark of a functional loving family is that we can fight well without fear of reprisal or rejection. Right? A healthy family can have a robust disagreement over dinner and can just go at it, but no one is worried about who gets kicked out after dessert. Right? And, and we just, because we got each other's back. And this is the homothumidon that we are called to fight for. But, you know, I had, I had a friend who, um, I have a friend, and his wife, um, they were on vacation, just his wife and daughter were staying somewhere. He wasn't around at the time. And th where they were on vacation, they would walk down to the beach. Every time they walked down the beach, there were, she was getting catcalls by some of the construction guys who were working around there. And, and, and he's just whistling, whatever. And, and, and so she, she stopped. And instead of doing a, a, a call-out culture, she tried the call-in culture. She stopped and still confronted them with their attitudes. Wrong. But she just did it slightly different way. She stopped. One day she's walking by and the guys are whistling and calling out. She just stopped and she said, hi, M my name is Susan. This is my daughter, Tracy. And we, um, uh, we just live over here and we're headed down there. And I, 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 and I want you to know how that affects me when you do that. She just began to have a conversation and explain. She asked them for their names and she asked them if they were married. What are the names of your wife? And, well, my husband's over here. Can I just, how do you feel? Why do you? Well, okay, I understand what you're trying to say when you say that, but let me just tell you how I experienced. And the guys just became humbled, perhaps humiliated, and it was a rebuke. Don't misunderstand me. It was a rebuke. It was a rebuke, though, that gave them a chance to actually have an enlightening moment of seeing her as a person instead of a booty, right? And say, that's true. She is walking with her daughter, and that's true. It's a, and she actually gathered them all together and had a little chat about, and then next day, because they were living there for a week, the next day they're like, hi, Susan, hello, little Tracy. See, the guys had a chance to be called out, but also called in, right? And so we're not just a call-out culture. We're also a call-in culture where we love our enemies enough to confront, but to know that this enemy of mine may need to eventually become my brother. I mean, that's ultimately my prayer, right? And so I'm going to give you a teachable moment. And, and the, it, sometimes the Internet, sometimes Twitter, sometimes social media just doesn't give us a chance to do that because negative, punchy, shaming gets retweets it gets likes it gets you know and we we live constantly for the likes the likes the likes the likes of the many but 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 as people of God we really should be living for the love of the one yeah. right right that's what defines us that's what says who we are so so this homothumadon is this I want to read a verse I have notes here and I just realized I haven't said anything in my notes yet I just <laughs> All right, we're just going with what this is then. This is all just introduction. <laughs> oh, Holy Spirit, help me. All right. Here it is. Here's this beautiful, the book, the word homothumadon is used regularly throughout the book of Acts. But there's this place where the Apostle Paul uses it in the book of Romans. I'm going to read that. Romans chapter 15. This may, it says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement and a, a, give you uh, the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So that, now this translation says right here, with one mind. And another translation may say, so that together, or, that, or with one accord, and with one voice as well, that you may glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the next word, accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you. That's a beautiful passage. Homothumadon then says, may, may God give you the same attitude that Christ had for you. He had a passion for oneness, for creating this one body. He had a snorting rage for our togetherness. He had this vision of bringing Jews and Gentiles together. There was no greater divide. You understand that. The, the New Testament's accomplishment in our lives, the New Covenant, broke, broke down the dividing wall. And the, the miracle, not just the miracles of Jesus and miracles of healing, resurrection from the dead, but the, the sociological miracle that validated the ministry of Jesus was a unity of diverse people that had never been seen before on the planet. And that can still be the evidence of the miraculous nature of the gospel today. And so Paul says here, 
I pray that you would have that same homothumadon that Christ Jesus has for you. And then the next verse, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. This is the premise for all New Testament ethics. All New Testament ethics ask this question. Are you wondering how to treat someone around you? Then simply pause for a moment and ask God how he has treated you. If you're unsure how to respond to someone around you in any given situation, it's an ethical question, what should I do? You stop and you say, God, how have you treated me when I've been in those shoes? And then you offer what you've been given. You offer what you've been given. And so here, you see this theme come up all the time when ethics are discussed. And so here the Apostle Paul says, accept others as Christ has accepted you. And here's one of the most beautiful truths of Scripture. Acceptance does not equal agreement. Acceptance does not equal agreement. Not on all things. When you have Jesus at the center, you work the rest out, but you work it out as family. When you confuse acceptance and agreement, when you confuse acceptance and agreement as though they're the same thing, and you end up disagreeing with someone, if you think acceptance and agreement are intertwined, and you're disagreeing with someone, you will feel the impulse to withhold acceptance in order to demonstrate your disagreement. Do you understand how painful that could be? When we do not understand how distinct they'll be, you, someone says something, you say, well, that's not biblical or that's not right. I can just tell you. You will start to give all of these micro behaviors, micro aggressions, micro separations that get between you and them that begin to, in a thousand and three, even subconscious ways, say, I'm creating distance between us because you're one of those people. You just said that, or you believe this, or you have that style or that way, and you will begin to pull back your acceptance because of disagreement. Again, that's the way of the world. But we are called to accept, knowing that it is distinct from agreement. And this can create a powerful unity that then gives us the tools we need, the emotional tools, to have robust conversations about our disagreement without it threatening our unity. Homo thumadon is worth fighting for. Let me say a little bit more. When I, um, <clears throat> this beautiful gospel is only achievable through Christ. There's no other force on the planet. And I want to share this with as many people as possible. I want to remind Christians and I want to share it with non-Christians. And maybe we've got a mix of both here. I want you to know only Jesus can offer this. Only Jesus. And as I've been getting older, I've been thinking, you know, time's running out. I've got to tell more people. Because we're not going to live very long. We're going to die soon. It doesn't matter if you live to be 100. It's going to be super soon. It's just as you get older, you realize it. So when I turned 50, I said, I've got to do something. I've got to do more things to have more Jesus conversations with more people. And that just kind of really dawned on me. I'm going to die soon when I turn 50. That's what hit me. I'm going to die soon. Okay, dude. Right? And, and, and you all go to die soon, just your age, you don't know it. Because when you're in your teens, you're like, I'm going to live forever. And then you're in your 20s, and you're like, I'm in the prime of my life. And then you're in your 30s, and you're like, I still got it. You hit 40, and it's 40's the new 30. And you hit 50, and it's like, yeah, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. There's no faking it now. This is it. Downhill and die. So I said, I, I got to do something to have more conversations. And so I said, I know what I'm going to do. So I, I made a list of different things I'm going to do to have more Jesus conversations with more people because I think he's the answer to every meaningful question that every heart, every soul is asking. And so I said, I'll, I'll do a list of things. And one of them, I said, I'm going to get a tattoo. I'm going to get a tattoo. I never had a tattoo before. Well, okay, I got my wedding ring tattooed. After losing my wedding ring three different times, I finally got it tattooed. And then it actually disappeared. So that's a bad omen, but let's not talk about it. Moving on. So I never got a real tattoo other than that. So I said, I'm going to get a Jesus tattoo, something to start conversations. And so I, I, I said, what should I, what should I get? I'll get a Bible verse, perhaps, because um, I'm not very artistic, so I'll just get a Bible verse to start Jesus conversations. But I was, I was reminded there's this verse. It was haunting me from my childhood that there was this verse I remember hearing talked about in church. I had to look it up. It's Leviticus 19.28. You know it? Say that. Leviticus 19.28. Leviticus 19.28. And it says, in fact, let me read it to you because I was wrestling through this. I want to get a tattoo to help me evangelize, but 
Yeah, Leviticus 19.28 says this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 19.28 says this. Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Whoa. He even adds the I am the Lord at the end. Like that's just a punch in the face. That's like pay attention. I am Yahweh and I approve this message. Like that's intense. Do not cut yourselves and do not put two tattoo marks on you. I am Yahweh. And so I thought, yeah, but what about if it's a Bible tattoo? Does that make it better or does that make it worse? Is, is God going to smite me or smile at me? Because all of my, all of the legalism of my childhood started coming back when I thought, I want to get a tattoo talk. And then I realized that the, the gospel is about the coming of this new covenant that not only, I catch you now, the, the good news of the gospel is not only that we are saved from our sin, but that we are also saved from our religion. You see, that we are freed up from the letter of the law in order to be filled with and participate with and move with the Spirit. So that the Apostle Paul says, in fact, if you're going to go back to the letter of the law, he says this in 2 Corinthians 3, but he says in all kinds of places, he says if you're going to go back to the letter of the law, you have to know that the letter kills. It's the Spirit that gives life. So that means we read our Bibles differently. I don't just say, what's the rule? What's the rule? I say, what's the reason behind the rule, given the context, and how do I live that out here today? I don't say just, what's the law? What's the law? What's the law? I say, what's the love embedded in the law, given the context, and how can I love that way today? Right? I I don't just say, what's the rule? I say, what's the reason? I want to know, I want to know where the spirit is in all of this, and and there is a principle embedded in every precept. And so I, I, I realized that the gospel was preached in promise form in the Old Testament. You know, in, in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah, we're told that God's going to write the law in our hearts one day. And in fact, he's going to fill us with his spirit. So his spirit will, will give us, well, first of all, give, give us a new heart and a new spirit. Take out our heart of stone, give us a heart of flesh. Then he put his spirit in us. And then he's going to guide us and he's going to help us to live. And he's going to, it's not just going to be a matter of saying, well, whatever the Spirit says, I do, because he's going to give us Jesus as an example. So we have the external example of Jesus. We have the internal leading of the Spirit. We have Scripture to always remind us of the teaching of Jesus. And we have the body of Christ to amplify the voice of the Spirit. We're not just the people who say, well, what's the letter of the law? We're the people who open up our Bibles, not just to find the rules, but to find the relationship with the person. So I, I said this in my workshop earlier today. Every time I open the Bible, I open it up to have a supernatural rendezvous with Jesus. This is the place I go. We don't put scripture aside, but we read it differently. We come here to meet with God and say, what is your spirit saying to me through the text? Um, as N.T. Wright says, the Bible's not just a, a painting to be stared at. It's a window to be looked through. All right? So it's not just a painting to be stared at that you mount on the wall. It's a window that you install in the wall of your soul to be looked through so that you can see the person on the other side who is Jesus. I don't just read the book because the book guides me. I read the book to help me get to know the person and he guides me. Christians are not just people of the book. We're people of the person. That's Jesus. And that, that come, he comes to us in the form of the Holy Spirit. So I, I, decided, I decided I'd get a tattoo to help me talk about this amazing Jesus. And, but I didn't know what Bible verse to get. You know, John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 10. You know, remember Leviticus 19, 28 says don't get a tattoo. But should I? I don't know. And then I decided, no, we're freed not only from our sin, but from our religion. What Bible verse would help me have conversations about this amazing freeing gospel? So I decided to get a Bible verse. I got Leviticus 19.28 on my arm, which is a fantastic conversation starter about Jesus. Starting with the dear woman who has given me the tattoo, who's, 
He's like, oh, you, want, you, want a, you want a Bible verse for a pad tattoo? Yeah, I said Leviticus 19.28. And she, and she wouldn't ask. She wouldn't even ask what it was. She was like, all right. And she got grumpy. She, I, and, as, and I asked her a story. and found out, as she's, because we got an hour to sit together while she's doing this or more. And she's telling me about some of her abusive childhood and how religion had really let her down. And how it really it was a, a religion. Christianity was a point of pain for her. And so she didn't even want to ask. Later I found out she was just assuming Leviticus something is probably, you know, he hates gay people or something. That's what it's about. I don't know. I'm just not going to ask. I'll just do the work and then be done with this bigot. And then finally halfway through, so she, I just learned her story. And then finally she said, all right, I'll bite, I'll bite. What does Leviticus 19.28 say? And she's halfway through the tattoo. And I say, oh, oh, that's that Bible verse that says, whatever you do, don't get a tattoo. It changed everything. It changed everything because then it led to a conversation. Well, aren't you insulting God? And I said, no, because Jesus has freed me not only from my sin, but from the letter of the law. He's freed me up to walk in the newness of life of the spirit, giving me a new heart. So I understand there's a context for the laws of Leviticus and their laws of love given their context. But now I ask the question, how does that get applied today? Because I walk in tune with the Spirit, with brothers and sisters who, who remind me of the same voice of the Spirit. I, I don't know if you ever saw the movie. Well, you probably didn't. So never mind. All right, all right. See, you ever, you ever see the movie, The Girl with All the Gifts? See, I knew it. Okay, all right, listen, treat yourself. It's on Netflix, The Girl with All the Gifts. Say that with me, The Girl with All the Gifts. Okay, it's about this sweet, innocent, lovely little girl. Her name's Melanie. I'm only going to give away the first 10 minutes, not a complete spoiler. Melanie, the beautiful little girl, and she is precocious, she's inquisitive, and she's so polite. She has, she has one problem. She is a zombie. Aside from that, she's delightful. Yes, it's true. Now, here's the thing. It is a zombie movie. So if you're freaked out by zombie movies, you know, take that with a grain of salt. And say, well, Pastor recommended I should watch this. This is not family movie night. Don't gather the kids around the telly. So it's this lovely British zombie movie. But here's, it has this amazing approach. You see, Melanie is one of the girls. She's a girl with all the gifts. But there's all, this whole generation of children zombies in this post-apocalyptic world, but these children have not lost their minds. They're infected with the zombie virus, but they're still like children. They're still who they are. They're not just these monsters who want to eat you. They're sweet children who also want to eat you, all right? And so the government has them under lock and key in this kind of research facility because they need to do experiments on them to try and figure out what's going on. How's the zombie virus working in their brains that they can still be normal, lovely people except you know, when they want to eat you? And, and so they, they have them... They have them in, hold on a second, what's this? Oh, that's my alarm. Sorry, it's time to get up. Um, I had to set a timer because, you know, I just keep going. So that's my 10-minute timer. We're going to wrap it. We're landing the plane. We're landing the plane. So she, I know now you're going to say, oh, the music's getting in the way of the teaching. Uh, right, you're right, right, yeah, right, right, sure, sure, sure. Right, so listen, Melanie, Melanie, the girl with all the gifts. So you got these children zombies, and the government's experimenting on them, and part of it is to give them at least some education. they got to develop their minds, give them education. So the movie opens up with, they are kept in prison cells, and whenever they're transported from the prison cell to the classroom, at gunpoint, with multiple guards around with guns, they're put into these, these chairs, they're like wheelchairs to transport them, but they're strapped in, legs are strapped, arms are strapped, heads are strapped, and they're wheeled into the classroom, and they're given, good morning, Mrs. So-and-so, they have a nice lesson, one arm can be unstrapped so they can do some writing, and strap back up again and as and they're doing these experiments to figure out a cure but there's a debate going on are these sweet children who have been affected by a zombie virus or are they little monsters who are deceiving us into thinking that they are children and as I'm watching this I'm thinking isn't this the age-old debate are humans basically good or basically bad you're right are we are, are, are we good people who are infected by sin so we sometimes do bad things? Or are we basically monsters pretending to be good? And by the way, when someone asks me that, are humans basically good or basically bad? I, my response is, well, we are basically broken. 
We're basically broken, which suggests we are something good to begin with, but we have been broken, and that's the tragedy. Listen, the gospel doesn't begin with, you are a sinner in need of a savior. That preaches as though the gospel starts in Genesis chapter three. But there's two chapters before that. The Bible begins not in Genesis chapter three, but in Genesis chapter one. You are first and foremost a precious, an infinitely precious image bearer of God. And that's what makes it tragic, because the fall is tragic, because you were designed for something better. See, if you just see a worm wiggling around in the dirt, you don't say, that's so tragic. That worm's getting all dirty. <laughs> when you see a worm in the dirt wiggling around, you just say, oh, that's what worms do. And if we're just sinners, you just say, well, that's what sinners do. But the tragedy is that that's not our calling. That's not what we were meant to be. We're made in the image of God. And even after the fall, both in Genesis 9 and in the book of James, Old Testament and New Testament, the Bible refers to all people, even non-Christians, as precious image bearers of God. Even though we have been tainted and warped by sin, we have not lost the image of God in us. Every person you meet is precious, infinitely, bearing the image of God. The gospel then is the good news that the brokenness can be put back together, not just me as an individual, but us as a society, as a new society called the church. And so this message is so beautiful. Are you a... It's, it's the healing. It's the healing for the zombie virus. And as I was thinking about this, I'm watching the movie. I interpret everything through zombie allegory, so I apologize. It's my thing. As I'm watching this, I think, strapping him down and doing research to minimize the damage, isn't that a picture of religion? Because that's, that's all religion can offer. Religion will give you enough rules, regulations, rituals, and routines to help you minimize the damage, but it can do nothing to heal the brokenness of your heart. But Jesus brings the Spirit. The Spirit. He promises the Spirit. And the Spirit is so identified with Christ that when the Spirit comes, he's bringing the mind of Christ to us. Did you ever notice that? The last words of Jesus are hilarious. The last words of Jesus, he gives the great commission that ends with, you know, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the ends of the earth. And then he disappears. <laughs> Basically, I want you to know this. I will never, ever, ever leave you. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> and he's gone. How, how do we reconcile that? Because the Spirit comes. And the Spirit so represents Jesus to us. He's called the mind of Christ. Because technically, where is Jesus? The New Testament talks about Jesus inside us. But technically, Jesus is up in heaven at the right hand of the Father. It's the Spirit that we have. But the Spirit is so aligned with the character and mind of Christ that we have Jesus with us. Jesus with us. And so with... With this I close, which I've, I've learned are just beautiful words to hear fall from the mouth of an overly long preacher man. With this I close. This, this, uh, this great commission that ends with Jesus saying, I'm going to be with you forever. How does it start? How does it start? Well, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. I mean, even before that. Even before that, how does it start? In the verse just before the Great Commission, it says this. When they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And then you get the Great Commission. The words just before that are, when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Think about this for a moment. The Greek construct says that all the disciples were worshipping, and within that group of worshippers where they're all worshipping, there is a subgroup of those who are doubting, because they can't wrap their mind around this. They're not doubting, like, where did Jesus go? He's appearing to them, and they're doubting. 
It's not even like Thomas saying, I can't see him, so I have doubts. He appears to them, and it's so overwhelming. The reality of the gospel is so overwhelming. Sometimes, even when it smacks you, you know, dead in the face, you're going to say, I don't know if I can believe this. This is wild. Can this really be true? I have all of these questions. They worshipped him, but some are doubting in the process. It says they worshipped him. Again, the Greek construct, the grammar, is meaning all of them worshipped. They're not two separate groups. Some of them worshipped. Some of them doubted and pouted. They all worshipped and some of those worshipers at the same time were doubting, questioning. I want to leave this with you as a word of encouragement. Your doubt does not discredit your faith. Your doubt does not discredit your faith. Jesus changed the world by entrusting his message with a group of doubting worshipers who said, we are filled with questions and we do not have all the answers but I will still sing your praises. I will still declare my loyalty. While I am still a mixed up questioning person, I will still say, Jesus, I'm yours. And we bring our doubts and we bring our questions into a safe place where we do not have it all figured out, where we are questioning some of the stuff we've been taught from our childhood onward and we're, we're wrestling what our future looks like and we say, it's not a matter of, I get all the answers and I stay in the faith or I have too many questions so I leave. I worship Jesus as I walk with Jesus and I talk with Jesus and I raise my questions with Jesus and my doubts with Jesus and he is not threatened. He says, actually, that kind of authenticity, we can change the world together. Let's do this. Let's do this. And so I say to you, let's do this. If you're a questioning, doubting, worshiping brother or sister, let's change the world together. We can do this. Amen? Amen. I'm not in a hurry. When it comes to your sleep